Wow, I have to thank you again for this warm uh, welcome and introduction. It's a tremendous honor for me to be here, and it's a real pleasure to be able to share some of my ideas with you. Uh, thinking about the intro, in fact, the first book was a, an odd experiment. Uh, I wouldn't recommend reading it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> lately, after the fourth title, there's, there's been quite a break, and I've uh, been approaching things quite differently. So I think uh, what we're going to be going through here, and, and shamefully, I don't cite Carol in this talk. So that's a critique. Um, <laughs> you're a genius, Matt. This is OK. So uh, I'll begin with this acknowledgment of country. And um, forgive me for being uh, a bit untraditional in this way. So I acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose territory the University of Victoria stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wisanic. I hope I pronounced their name correctly. Wisanich. Wisanich. Oh boy, I'll practice. Uh, I recognize their relationships with the land which continue to this day. But I also want to live by my understanding of Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak's encouragement about one's duty to the subaltern. And that duty is to carefully listen, and should it be clear to us that the subaltern wants us to share their words, that we should then speak their intentions wherever possible so that they can be heard, or when they are heard, have their message amplified. I therefore follow indigenous scholar Lindsay Schneider, a descendant of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, who asks that after a land acknowledgement, we think about what we can do to support the indigenous peoples around us, specifically those whose land we live play, and work on. Schneider asks in particular that we each think about what we can do to give land back to indigenous people. Others, whose voices appear in the Yellowhead Institute's red paper on cashback, like the Anishinaabe economist Winona Leduc, are clear that settler colonists need to think about how they can give revenue back to indigenous peoples whose lands they live on. Both giving land back and cash back are instrumental for resisting colonial Canada's windigo, or cannibal, <coughs> economy. Justin Leifso, Lifeso, Lifeso, that's a good one, and <coughs> Anna Ketaliva are, of course, clear that the so-called Canadian Federation is an environmentally destructive and extractive petrostate. It makes sense that this must be opposed. We are asked to give land back or cash back for the sake of our, and that's a big hour of all beings future. So if you own land, and I say own with inverted commas, there's a parable, I can't attribute it uh, for lack of capacity, but it's something along the lines of if you are trying to own land, it's like trying to own the air, right? So ownership in this sense. So if you own land, please think about giving it back. As I understand it, some indigenous nations will buy it from you to avoid economic injury. If you own a house or apartment or similar, please think about paying a voluntary tax to the nation whose land you are benefiting from. I'm certain there are other encouragements that we could all put forward here. I've got more than a few, but we can't for time. Perhaps we can each try to perform our respective services to the subaltern, as Spivak encourages, in the many future land acknowledgments that you and I will give. I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes, Pache, uh, from my book, Democracy Therapy, Democratic Treatments for Our Authoritarian Lives. I'm still tinkering with the text, so if you're interested after I've spoken my piece, please let me know, and I'll ensure a copy finds its way to you once it's published. I'm trying to work with a big idea here, and I purposefully hop around the argument as it's given in the book. Consequently, we lose detail and a bit of stitching along the way. That's, as we all know, a necessary loss to such acts of translating from one form to another. So if there's a point you'd like more on, maybe that's something we can discuss afterward. In what follows, I'm going to argue that we need to democratize our social lives, which are overwhelmingly authoritarian. 
because we get benefits from doing so. To get there, though, we will need to work through non-humans, who are said to behave democratically, ancient Inca astronomy, namely a logic inherent in their dark constellations, and a song by Metallica. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. To say that democracy is a social problem too presupposes that it is a problem elsewhere as well. Indeed, given the research on democratic crises from around the globe, it would be a rare event to find a scholar of democracy who holds the opinion that all is well as concerns the way democracies function and that we've nothing to worry about. When I refer to the vast literature, I'm speaking about the many ways political democracies have been shown over centuries and continue to be shown today through both theoretical and empirical research to be embarrassing themselves. This is an expression I borrow from Rong Xin Li. By embarrassment, Li means that democracies are not living up to people's expectations, nor a democracy's own hype. But the troubles run deeper than this, as Nadia Urbinatia bears, as democracies are described to be disfiguring themselves. As democracies are failing, some say regressing, into authoritarianisms. As you will note, I resist defining both democracy and authoritarianism in great detail because it is up to the people who seek the democratization of some aspects of their social lives to specify what both terms mean for them in their contexts. I do not, therefore, go further than to say that democracy means power sharing and authoritarianism doesn't. For the latter, power sharing, rather, power is concentrated into the few over the many. I also want to emphasize the point that political democracies have, as far as I'm aware, always been problematic for a different reason. That being of exclusion, of genocide, of racism, of sexism, of homophobic and religious bigotry, of environmental destruction, of colonialism and inequality, of the totalitarian reign of terror over non-humans, of reifying the macrophage known as capitalism. That's Nancy Fraser's phrasing. As Michael Hanchard and Luke Temple, for example, remind us, political democracy is not a good in itself for everyone. And by everyone, I mean all beings, sentient and otherwise, which Jim Tully, Keith Cherry, Pablo Uziel, and other members of these esteemed halls make clear in their book, Democratic Multiplicity. But the stereotypically political, the parliaments and street protests, political parties and Senate committees and so on, is not our locus this afternoon. It's not what I intend our conceptual place for discussion to be. We are rather focusing into the social sphere, which I will now turn to arguing has been neglected in democracy studies, and much to our peril, because authoritarianism denies us so very many developmental and even existential benefits and possibilities. I'll give a few examples of these benefits in what's to come. I'm not aware of a more profound way to illustrate our overemphasis on the political when it comes to where we mentally situate democracy than to argue that we seem to be the only species on Earth that does this. Let's quickly turn to a beautiful strand of scholarship, which is the observational studies devoted to non-human decision-making, behavior, and culture. What buffalo, geese, honeybees, wasps, mongoose, meerkats, slime molds, red deer, trees in a forest, apes, social spiders, the earth or Gaia, itself or herself, and hundreds of our other cousins, neighbors, and elders have in common, is that they have all been said to be, in some sense, democratic by biologists. 
If you'd like to examine a productive collaboration between disciplines, I recommend papers by Christian List, who brings political science to the partnership, so to speak, and both Larissa Conrad and Timothy J. Roper, who bring biology of the sort that we've been discussing here. The lives of non-humans are arguably based on consensus or majority formation, quorum seeking, the balance of powers, even the right to exit. Power is rarely, if ever, concentrated solely into one individual over all other individuals. Tyranny of that sort seems hard to find among non-humans. Power among the democratically described non-humans is arguably always a question of constant negotiation, compromise, conflict, and resolution. For our discussion, what is most relevant here is that no other species has established a separation between the social and the political concerning where power is located and shared or contested. Put differently, among non-humans, the use of democracy in one guise or another hasn't been cordoned off into, say, a constitution, vertically stacked parliaments, and many publics. It is always located in the group, small or large, and is always in question among the members of those groups. There is risk here to argue that the separation of the social and the political is an altogether human tendency. But, as anthropologists like Wade Davis show us, such a claim would efface the multitudes of human cultures, of ethnicities, who never separated the social and the political, and who resist the encouragement from colonists and multinational colonizer organizations to do so. For one example, think about the acephalous nations today, such as the Baca peoples in Central Africa. The separation of the social and the political is, it seems to me, an altogether imperial tendency or strategy so that power can be concentrated into the hands of the few, so that empire can force itself onto the many and onto the lands upon which the many live in a bid to stay propitiously and rapaciously alive. We're going to shift now that we know my argument is about social things and not public things, as Bonnie Honig has termed them. As an aside, I like reminding my students that, uh, yes, public things is actually a technical term. So they don't seem to be impressed as I am by that, but nevertheless. <laughs> so we're shifting now to focus on the lack of democracy in social spaces like families, schools, apartment or condo buildings, aged or otherwise specialized care residences, hospitals, even our individual mental states, or what I otherwise term our psychogenic selves. Differently put, the focus that we're tilting into now is the odious dominance of authoritarianism in those and other social spaces. And I want to present those social spaces to you as a constellation because this offers an animate conceptual geometry for us to work with. One that can move for us, but also one that we can move with. This will make sense in a moment. I also want to introduce the constellation through an attempted decolonized manner. As Stephen Goldberg and colleagues explain in their work on comparative indigenous astronomy, the striking appearance of our galaxy in the night sky serves as a reference to traditional knowledge, encoding science and culture to a memory space. Working from this memory space can provide a non-colonial starting point, one that we can try to anchor our thinking in, as if it were a bay for our ideas, which is an approach that Frederick C. Schaefer would hopefully approve of. So I'm not going to be drawing on so-called Western astronomy to formulate the constellation I will shortly introduce, but have rather studied, in my own humble way, ancient Inca astronomy for this purpose. Ancient Inca, along with indigenous peoples in so-called Australia, 
and a number of indigenous nations in the continent of Africa have offered us a brilliant way of navigating the night sky. I focus on the Inca because of how they came to insist on the animacy of a specific set of constellations. You see, the Inca not only developed constellations from the illuminated aspects of the night sky, such as are presented to us by stars and their photons reflected off of planets and comets, they also developed constellations from the dark, dusty spaces between the stars and the planets and comets in the Great River, or what in English we refer to as the Milky Way. It gets better. For the Inca, the illuminated constellations were fixed and not considered animate. It was the dark constellations that were thought to be alive. They are the astral equivalents of animals and ecologies, like rivers, on Earth. The dark constellations live between the fixities. They bear lives of their own in places that few human cultures have ever cared to look. The example given in this image is Machique, the serpent. It's a noteworthy coincidence that Machique's head appears and disappears with the coming and going of summer, because it so happens to mark the time that snakes are active in parts of the Andes, when it is warmer. But it is also said to foretell the start and the finish of the rainy season. This, as Goldberg and company explain, is why the Inca associated snakes with water. Indeed, as the 16th century chronicler of the Spanish invasion, Polo de Ondegardo noted, Inca believed that the animal constellations were responsible for the procreation and augmentation of their animal counterparts on Earth. Returning to Gulberg and friends, they further explained that Inca cosmology viewed the Milky Way as a river flowing across the night sky in a very literal sense. They saw earthy waters as being drawn into the heavens and then later returned to Earth after a celestial rejuvenation. The Earth was thought to float in a cosmic ocean. When the celestial river's orientation was such that it dipped into that ocean, the waters were drawn into the sky. The Milky Way is therefore an integral part of the continuing recycling of water throughout the Quechua universe. I'm intending for the constellation that I will introduce you to now to be living as such. We are benefiting directly here from Inca astronomy because it shares with us a logic of concepts that are meant to be taken literally and seriously as concepts that do bear on our day-to-day -day lives. As with other civilizations heavily dependent on agriculture, the Inca worked with constellations and other celestial objects throughout the day and the night to help them better understand how inexplicably intertwined and interdependent they were and are with the Earth and the universe. As D. Kala Perkins writes, human culture, civilization, and biogeography and geology were for the Inca appreciated as reflections and harmonics of cosmic dynamics. For the Inca, this work was done, this attention was given to better understand the growing season to come. The point in this is to say for the Inca, astronomy was about survival. It was about quality of life, abundance, and the avoidance of suffering. They were also an empire. It could have been for other reasons altogether. <laughs> but it was about trying to secure some kind of good in the things that come from a well-timed, well-worked, well-understood growing season. It is this very intention that I will now try to carry over. As you take in the social spaces presented in this image, from families, schools, workplaces, and so on, I would like to invite you to think about your personal experiences in them. What would you characterize your family or fostered life as when you were small, or perhaps now that you may be a parent 
or guardian yourself. If you grew up with, or presently live with, a non-human like a dog, think about them too. Where do they fit in the dynamics of a family's or a household's power? How was or is the power exercised? How were you treated and how do you now treat? Could you characterize your time as a child or your time now rearing children as somehow democratic? And if it was or is democratic, was it sufficiently so? Could it have been or still be more democratic? And would that have been better or would that be better for you, for those in your care? Let's take a moment, just a brief 15 seconds, to contemplate this in silence and let our memories pull forward. I invite you now to extend this reflective practice to your time in, for example, there's a list, preschool, elementary school, summer camps, middle school, after school programs, high school and parties, <laughs> then your undergraduate and postgraduate studies, maybe even homeschooling. Bring your mind to power. Who had it in these spaces? How was it used? Is there anything to be said about democratic sufficiency here, of power sharing, of power ever being up for grabs or negotiation in ways that you would have found or currently find meaningful? Now think about your experiences at work, which many have spent and will spend some estimated 80,000 hours of their lives in or in any of the other social spaces associated with the constellation that I'm sharing with you here. What the literature on these spaces tells us is that they are all likely, and likely in majority, authoritarian, in whom power is held and how it is applied. For example, in a typical family or household, it is the parents or guardians who tend to hold power and exert it over their children or wards including non-humans like the earlier mentioned dog, but also other sentient beings in and around their homes and private gardens. In some cases, that power dynamic is inverted, where, for instance, a sole parent is rendered subordinate to the sometimes terrifying demands of the child. Further to this, in a heterosexual couple, it is typically the male partner who holds greater power than the female partner who is often expected to perform stereotypical gender roles around homemaking. I'm here reminded of last week's impressive presentations at the Center for Global Studies by Masumi Izumi and Andrea Mariko Grant, where Andrea shared how her grandmother thanked her grandfather for allowing her to act freely for decades in pursuit of her tanka poetry. We also heard testimony from Masumi about how some children negatively viewed mothers who did not conform to the children's expectations of how a mother should behave. My personal experiences in family, schooling, work, hospitals, and apartment buildings has been instructive in authoritarianism. In elementary school in both Germany and Canada, I only recall being given power over small decisions. What sort of material would I use for a project or whether I would go on an excursion, things like that. Everything else was regimented, hierarchical, and patronizing. I'm confident you have memories of your own, of desks organized in perfect rows, standing each morning to sing Canada's colonial propaganda. And if you came up in this construct, uh, you would probably remember that divergent behavior wasn't explored between teacher and pupil for what teacher these days has got time for that, and indeed back in those days as well. We were rather mocked or punished by them to encourage conformity or simply just to help them get through their workday. Now, I will admit, 
I was not an easy student to teach. But that's no reason to throw chalk at my head for falling asleep during a bland moment in history class. We weren't taught to settle our differences in the schoolyard through emotionally intelligent and gentle or caring conversation. We settled our differences, and this is in Kingston, Ontario, with bloodied noses, insults, and damaging each other's property. In Quebec, my father was repeatedly beaten as a child for writing with his left hand. He pushed that nun who beat him down a flight of stairs. I suppose I got off lucky. In my book, I take this reflective and qualitative approach to arguing that our social spaces are in majority authoritarian. And I do this because, as far as I'm aware, there is no regularly globally representative, even nationally representative survey that is interested in measuring how democratic our social lives are. Consider the European Social Survey, or ESS. It recently completed a multi-country survey on democracy, but only one, maybe two questions, could be said to be useful to our needs here. And we're going to return to that in a moment. All other questions were about stereotypically political things, such as political party allegiance, voting choices, confidence in the judiciary, the legislative's capacity to contest executive power, the performance of public administration, and so forth. The questions from the ESS that may be useful to us are, however, and for me, insufficiently so. For example, one of the questions on card 17 asks respondents if obedience and respect for authority are the most important values a child should learn. I'm pretty sure that came from Adorno's California F scale, <laughs> if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, anyway, what does this question from the ESS mean, though? Authority does not, for example, hold the same meaning as authoritarianism. If we are interested in gleaning whether either yes or no is of use to us about understanding the governance character of a number of families in certain countries, then we get nothing from this question. And that's because an authoritarian inclined respondent might say yes, but so too a democratically inspired respondent, as rules, for example, can be negotiated in a deeply democratic way and should, it stands to reason, be respected by all members of the family as its established authority, as its rule of law. The point here is that we don't have good coverage when it comes to measuring and to understanding the number, for example, of individuals who are trying to live democratically within themselves, nor the number of families, schools, workplaces, and so on, that are also trying to do this. Whilst not an exception to my claim, the space that does the best in trying to capture such measures is, of course, workplaces. And this is being led by the global workplace cooperative movement. I faced this problem of spotty coverage at the outset of my undertaking and needed to make do with the methodology that first limited the social spaces I would examine. So the book is not inclusive as this talk and that I would need to draw on every scrap of knowledge that I could come by about the social spaces that I focused on. Be that, excuse me, qualitative, quantitative, personally reflective, and discursive. By discursive, I mean that I've spoken to a few experts per chapter to help connect these disparate data. This is a problem for the argument that I'm making. And the problem goes like this. How can I claim that most social spaces are authoritarian and therefore needing to be democratized when there is no mass and aggregated proof that they are? <clears throat> the only response I have to this is premised on the fact that the literature, which spans all continents, on how all of the spaces that have so far been mentioned in this talk do not say that they are in majority democratic. 
they are rather in majority all about the opposite of how to democratize these social spaces, of how to contest authoritarianism in them, why we might like to do that, and what benefits we can expect from such efforts. Further, in all of my personal reflections and experiences to date, and discussions with others about their reflections and experiences to date, not once has someone explained to me, not once have I been able to explain to myself, that a social life has been lived democratically. Let's move away from research methods and memory and finally name this dark constellation of ours that does bear an animacy and an immediacy of concern for every single one of us. I call it the unforgiven. CF Metallica. And from here on, I will refer to all social spaces as such because I'm trying to provoke the counterfactual. It is a gift to prove my assertion wrong because a social space that you find meaningfully democratic can act as a site of inspiration for the other social spaces that are, in each person's own experience, authoritarian, at least until proven otherwise. Let's now turn to the belief in this work over democracy being good or better than authoritarianism. We will do so by going through the opening lines to a song by Metallica, and then by drawing on related evidence from why democracy in the unforgiven is preferable to its presumed authoritarian status quo. The song starts as follows, and please forgive the male protagonism. New blood joins this earth, and quickly he's subdued. Through constant pained disgrace, the young boy learns their rules. In this first stanza, we have an expression of conformity, of subjugation, and the abnegation of a child's unique spirit. Wang Luo and Wang, in their 2023 focus on consultative coordination in the family, demonstrate that it doesn't have to be this way. Parents or guardians can encourage a child's autonomy and self-expression through supportive suggestion and, as I understand it, an open form of negotiation. The next stanza in the song reads, With time the child draws in, this whipping boy done wrong. Deprived of all his thoughts, the young man struggles on and on. I understand this stanza as a description of how an individual's unique spirit or character or soul, if you prefer, is imprisoned within the self through authoritarian education. That the individual's mental state is effectively colonized by the powers oppressing them in their context, that they need to be struggled against to maintain acceptance by one's peers, to maintain social standing, income, and so forth, especially into later life as work takes hold. Rodrigo Mayorga explains from the interviews he conducted with high school students in Chile who voted to occupy their school for weeks to, propose, uh, excuse me, to protest proposed governmental reform of public education and other issues, that a democratic education can allow for other developmental opportunities. Students in a democratic school should have a sporting chance to determine the conditions of their education, to explore their power in agonistic context between their peers, parents, teachers, principals, and their relevant ministry of department or education. In this context, one's thoughts are not shut down, but rather encouraged. There's always a real chance that something may happen. The struggle is positive, reflective, and nurtured. The literature on workplace democracy, or equality, inclusion where it matters for the workers in question, and autonomy make similar claims 
and demonstrates higher satisfaction, even happiness ratings, than are found in authoritarian workplaces. I have much more to share from the literature, but for time, we'll reserve them for discussion. If you like, ask me about the taste makers. That's a really good story. It is here from this evidence that I developed the fault line in the book, which defines the preference for democratic living and the aversion toward maintaining what I claim to be the authoritarian status quo. For example, to live democratically affords a different developmental pathway for individuals and children especially. From Hubert Herrmann's approach to inner democracy to Fathali Mogadam's actualized democracy, both Hermans and Mogadam are psychologists, comes the encouragement to cultivate a parliament within the self, to inhabit a republic of the imagination where discussions play out between your so-called self and the others that inhabit your mind. The benefits of cultivating a democratic psychology are numerous and they include the capacity to humanize strangers, even ones that may disgust us, which is believed to lead to kinder, less violent or vitriolic interpersonal relations through to a gentler and less stressful quality of being with ourselves. In the latter, we have a choice. Do we tyrannize ourselves through an unbreakable, unshakable adherence to a colonial mindset? And here I mean the usual capitalistic and patro, excuse me, petro-masculine life ways or do we make ourselves vulnerable to the many voices, to all those opinions and possibilities, to risk being caught talking to ourselves? I mentioned that the book deals with fewer social spaces. Indeed, these are mainly the self, family, school, and workplace. Each chapter explains the purported benefits that come to the people who are trying to live democratically in them. And in this is the avowal that those benefits are not being received or are not being received as fully as they could be by people when they are living in authoritarianism. It is this distinction that led me to both name the book Democracy Therapy and to commit to the therapeutic potential that may come from the democratic treatments of our social lives. So I do argue that living under authoritarianism and subjecting others to that power arrangement is wrong. I argue that it is unforgivable to maintain authoritarianism in our social lives because it denies us and it denies the others in our care access to developmental possibilities and life ways that are distinctively different to what is habitually permitted to what is normally experienced. We haven't had time to go through spillover theory where a democratizing social sphere can lead to democratic gains in the political sphere and that factors into the justifications for my argument as well. This is where things turn in the book from being problem focused to being solutions minded. We have Metallica to think, <laughs> thank excuse me for this as well. Let's come back to the protagonist in their song. Where we left him, he was begrudging his existence. Now he is trying to protect himself and to come to terms with his past. The sense of protection comes in this stanza. Now he's known a vow unto his own, that never from this day his will they'll take away. The protagonist is waking to what he has sacrificed and presumably at this point middle-aged, he decides to resist and protect his vestigial spirit. The sense of reckoning with his past is given in these two, I think, heartbreaking stanzas that now contain a refrain. <clears throat> what I felt, what I've known, never shined through in what I've shown. Never be, never see won't see what might have been. Let's skip the refrain and land on the last two lines. Never free, never me. So I dub thee unforgiven. 
Unfortunately, the song ends showing that the protagonist's vow was not one that he could keep. Although the protagonist tries to please the people that run his life, insert whatever reference comes to mind for you here, management, partners, children, doctors, whatever, these attempts just make him bitter. The last two stanzas that I would like to share from this song are chilling. <clears throat> Throughout his life the same, he's battled constantly. This fight he cannot win. A tired man, they see, no longer cares. The old man then prepares to die regretfully. That old man here is me. The only conclusion that I'm willing to derive from this is that we are all individually to blame. And relying on Nietzsche and Taoist philosophy, I take responsibility for my own affairs in the epilogue to the book. I know to say that this is on each our own shoulders is not fair because we are captives in authoritarian constructs. But if we don't assume responsibility for this, I don't think it's reasonable to expect that public things like governments, social work institutions, protest movements and such will take greater interest in the democratization of social spaces. If we're not democratically minded, and if we're not trying to democratize the social spaces we find ourselves in, and remember, these spaces are where we spend the majority of our lives in. In the case of ourselves, that's the entirety of it. <laughs> if we're not democratically minded about them, then we are unforgivable. There's an activist in me that wants to print <coughs> large stickers and then go back to my former schools and workplaces and label them as such. I think it's quite obvious that when I look into the mirror, these words are present, unforgivable. I want to conclude here and to do so with a plan for how to become forgiven. As I've discovered through personal attempts over the years, democratizing a few of the social spaces that I've drawn attention to in this talk is astoundingly difficult. We don't have time to go through all of my reasons for why that's the case. So I'll give just two short ones. The first comes from workplace democracy, or my attempt to enact it, which in my case is a university. I'm terrified of losing my income that both I and my family depend on. To borrow a line from the author Hatsuya Egami, which Masumi Izumi shared with us in her talk last week, I do want to live a naked life where there is poetry and truth with the executive management of my university. But something tells me the members of that executive will not be happy to bear it all with me, even if figuratively, through acts of radically transparent and free-flowing conversation. The second reason comes from my attempt to democratize my relationship with myself. Like so many others, I just don't have the time to do it. If I'm not working, then I'm cleaning. If I'm not cleaning, then I'm cooking. If I'm not cooking, then I'm caring for others or myself through a bit of sport or trying to catch up on sleep. It's just too hard as Wendy Brown makes clear in her book, Undoing the Demos, which Oliver Schmidtke refers to in his own work. It is from this realization that the book ends. We can't do this democratization work alone, even though the responsibility does, as I aver, fall on ourselves to take the initiative to form political communities and movements and such around these concerns. <clears throat> What would be beneficial, I think, is for a center of social work to be brought together to advocate for social democratization and to support the individuals who want to undertake that work. Such a center can also try to provide training for families and other organizations like schools and workplaces on how to democratize and what benefits they can expect in so doing. 
The mission of such a center is to try to support the unforgiven's transition into the forgiven. And it is here that human geography comes into play because now we have a program to test on a locality. Imagine if such a center existed at this university and that it was in the service of the people living in, on, and with so-called Vancouver Island. Or if you're not from here, like me, imagine such a center in your own vicinity. Would you give your effort to help run it? Would you go to it to seek guidance? Importantly, it doesn't take a grant to make a center like the one I've briefly envisioned here. It just needs a group of people who are willing to do the work and a place where individuals can feel respected and safe when they come for advice and support. It could happen in these very halls. And so we're arrived. We began with an observation that some humans, especially those captured by empire, are in the habit of separating the social from the political. So when the word democracy is evoked, that sign, whatever it means to the user, calls forward a political referent, like an election ballot, and not a social referent, like the family. We then worked through Inca astronomy so that we could make use of a conceptual geometry that is both animate and immediate to each our own individual lives. For the Inca, their constellations, especially the dark ones, were relied upon to grow food and avoid the horrors of mass starvation or imperial domination. I'm reading it nicer. For me, the constellation I've called the unforgiven is relied upon to grow social democracy and to free ourselves from the stunting, patronizing, frustrating, injurious, depressing, imprisoning, humiliating, there's more, and sometimes <laughs> <laughs> violent effects of authori uh, excuse me, authoritarianism, I draw all of those directly from the literature, by the way, in our private lives. Now imagine the unforgiven moving for us as we try to democratize it. Whereas Machaque, the serpent's movements, foretold the time of summer, snakes, and rain for the ancient Inca, perhaps the movement of the unforgiven will foretell redemption for the many, maybe even for us all. It's not as if people haven't been trying to democratize personal psychology, families, schools, workplaces, and hospitals, for example. In fact, efforts on these fronts are centuries old. So why aren't more of these places democratic? How is it that the suspicion is so strong that authoritarianism remains entrenched in those and other social spaces? I offered one answer, which is because it's too hard to democratize our social lives alone, and that we need specialized social workers. And I want to be clear now, that this could be us, or it could be the people that we train to support individuals in undertaking these efforts and in benefiting from this so-called democracy therapy. I'm certain you have your own answers to the question, and I look forward to learning from your insights now and in our time to come. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you, Jean-Paul. I will moderate two ways. <laughs> Democratic. Okay, oh, holy moly, okay. Uh, I have Amy.